Welcome, everybody, to Beer Smith Podcast number 70. We've got a great show for you today. We've got John Palmer coming in and Colin Kaminsky talking about their new water book. I think you're going to enjoy that very much. Uh, the big announcement for this week is I do have Beer Smith 2.2 out now. And you can grab that at the download page at beersmith.com. And that's uh, for desktop. That includes uh, PC, Mac, and Linux. Uh, so you ought to d- definitely check that out. I got a lot of great features added to that. Uh, Beersmith 2.2 includes recipe archiving. It has uh, Whirlpool Hop Edition uh, calculations and, and a whole bunch of new stuff. Just some great stuff there. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in that, go to beersmith.com. You can go to the download page or you can go to the blog and learn about some of the new features. And now without further ado, I'd like to jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is John Palmer and Colin Kaminsky. They're co-authors of the new book, Water, A Comprehensive Guide to Brewing. John is the author of the top-selling How to Brew book, as well as Brewing Classic Styles. And he speaks both nationally and internationally on uh, beer brewing and home brewing. Colin Kaminsky has consulted with the University of California, Davis, was a product designer at More Beer, and is now the master brewer at Downtown Joe's Brewery. It's great to have you guys on the show. Thanks a lot, Brad. Thank you. So, Colin, uh, unfortunately, Colin did not have uh, video today. So, so for those of you watching the video, I apologize. But, um, but John, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you started out to create the ultimate book on water for beer brewers. Uh, How would you get started trying to build a book entirely about beer water? Well, um, several years ago, uh, Brewers Publications uh, talked about the the Brewing Elements series where they would have, you know, uh, malt, he- yeast, um, hops, and water as a four-book set. And um, Brewers Publications contacted both uh, Colin and I regarding it, um, myself, because I've, I mean, both, my, I've, yeah. both of us have always <laughs> been very interested in water. And, uh, you know, myself, I wrote about it and how to brew and Colin, um, in his uh, brewing career, has had to adjust his water uh, almost daily, um, or at least weekly, uh, because of his uh, changing source water. So, Colin, um, yeah, I mean, why don't you kind of give it from your pr- perspective? Yeah, Colin, how did you get started on this project? Well, you know, I, I uh, ended up on a on a radio show talking about water one day, and and somebody said somebody asked the question on the show, um, "What pH do you need your water at in order to mash in at five two? And the person sitting next to me said, "You want your water at?" And he gave some number, and I said, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> no, it is not that easy." <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. I'd like to be able to do that. <laughs> Well, it isn't that easy because until you know the alkalinity, you don't know what pH you need. You don't know, and until you know the malt bill, you don't know where you're going to go. Right. But he was willing to categorically state that you needed this pH, and so I just went off on a two-hour diatribe and uh, realized that everybody didn't understand the basics of water chemistry, and so I started making an effort of going out and lecturing, and I was at. Uh, a lecture uh, and Gary Glass saw it and uh, uh, asked me if I was willing to co-author a book and he didn't tell me who I'd be co-authoring with and I said yeah sure you know let's get let's I, I'm tired of answering water water questions let's get a book out there so I don't have to anymore and and the next thing I knew John and I were on the project excellent well Colin uh, let's let's start at the beginning we're uh Let's start with where water comes from. How does the uh, major source, what are some of the major sources of tamp water? Um, well, in my, uh, where I am, um, we have well water um, that goes to the wineries. It doesn't really go to the municipality. My water sources uh, are from the municipality. We have two reservoirs that are very different from each other, one of which is um, uh, very alkaline, uh, very hard water. The other reservoir is um, uh, uh, from, um, it's not even granite, it's uh, uh, basalt, 
that's a basalt uh, reservoir. And so there's absolutely no hardness whatsoever. And it's the most expensive water we get. So they only switch me on to it for about five or six weeks a year. Um, but they do it randomly when it's the only water source. Then I have a third water supply that comes to me that's absolutely horrific. And it took me forever to figure out what was going on. So it comes out of the Sacramento Delta. So it's partly brackish. Um, uh, uh, it, it, and it goes through a lot of treatment. But right above the entrance to this huge aquifer that 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 supplies a lot of uh, uh, water, oh, including heretics water, for instance, um, Right above it is this bowl that's kind of mostly dry until it rains, and then it's it's a meadow, and there's cattle that graze in it, which is perfectly fine until this little bowl fills up with water and overflows into the inlet. And then what we have is the worst contaminated water for E. coli that you've ever seen. Nice. So then every then everybody scrambles to switch off of it. But right before they scramble to switch off of it, um, you get all of the the uh, uh, chlorinated halogens uh, uh, that make all the off flavors that you can imagine in in both tap water and then finishes through to beer. So I had to deal with these three water supplies. And it wasn't like I got a phone call that said, hey, you need to switch your water because we're doing this. Or, hey, don't brew for a week yeah. or whatever. And I've made all those decisions. I've literally said, look... I can smell the water in my shower. I am not brewing for a week. That's probably a good idea. How I, I was actually trying to get to the more general question, though. I mean, you've got what surface water, uh, well water. What are, what are some of the other major categories of uh, types of water you can find? Well, so well waters come from different sources. So so you can have surface waters that come out of rivers. Yeah, you can have surface waters that come out of uh, uh, um. Uh, reservoirs, mm-hmm. um, both of which have their own issues. So, so lakes and reservoirs have issues with uh, uh, biology uh, springing to life randomly based on season. <laughs> um, uh, rivers tend to be relatively fresh. Um, as a child, I was taught was taught if the water's white, you can drink it. So you would go to a rapid, you'd put your hands in, and you'd drink water straight out of the river. Well, that's actually pretty safe. That's, that water is being oxygenated, and it's relatively safe to drink. Um, then also we have uh, groundwater, and groundwater can come from a number of different uh, types of uh, minerals, um, which totally affects the kind of water that we've got. Um, around here, our water is alkaline, but it has lots of calcium. So it almost works for brewing beer, but it also it can it can use a little help. So, John, how does uh, different sources of water actually affect its mineral content? Well, as Colin is saying, groundwater sources, uh, you know, they spend time in the ground, and uh, there's a you know years, decades, even hundreds of years for minerals to uh, leach into the water. So you'll have higher concentrations of calcium uh, and carbonates, um, magnesium and its carbonates, uh, than you do as, say, a surface water. Surface water tends to be more similar to precipitation, such as you know rainwater or snow melt. And um, as Colin was saying earlier, one of his water sources comes from um, a basalt region where you have a very, this is a very hard rock as opposed to limestone, and uh, you get very little mineralization from the water, you know, flowing over and through this basalt strata. Um, so that, you know, your groundwater can vary in its mineral content depending on what kind of rocks it's flowing through. Um, whereas your surface water sources tend to be low mineral across the board um but they will have you know biological issues that groundwater doesn't such as algae and um animal waste and et cetera et cetera so uh Colin, how do you go about reading a water report so say I get a water report for my local water source how do i uh what are some of the things I want to look for there um 
I, I find most water reports are absolutely useless, um, to, to be <laughs> frank. Um, however, once in a while, you get some good information. Um, your total dissolved solids can give you a rough idea of what's going on. If your total dissolved solids are zero, well, then you know that you pretty much can add anything you want. Um, but once you go beyond that, they, they really... They're, and, and they're getting worse and worse. So when I started brewing, <laughs> water reports were better. The, they used to give you calcium and magnesium and alkalinity. They're not giving you those things anymore. They're giving you only the things that are required to report to meet the letter of the law. So I'm, I'm seeing the water reports get worse and worse and, and give you less and less useful brewing information. While they're still giving you health information, they're not giving you brewing information. And I don't really need to know my E. coli account. Uh, account because I'm going to boil the water anyways. Um, uh, there's all sorts of things in the water report I don't need to know. What I really want to know is calcium, magnesium, alkalinity, sulfate, and sulfites. Uh, so, or sulfates and, and chlorides, rather. And those give me the five ions that I need to do my job. Now, if there's a random ion out there that's a, like lead or something, it's probably not going to be in my tap water. Um, uh, if I'm a professional brewer and I'm making water for steam jackets, I might need to know a little bit more. But those five ions for home brewers or for brewers of my size, seven barrels, um, is pretty much all I really need to know. So, Colin, is it worthwhile getting your water tested then, maybe, if you can't get a good local water report? Or, or should you just go it, to the it, local homebrew shop and talk to them? It, it is worthwhile to go to Hawk. Uh, H-A-C-H dot com and getting a $120 titration kit and just testing it. There's a brewer's titration kit. Um, it wasn't available when I started testing my water, um, but I think I've sent enough people uh, to that website over the years that they've made a brewer's kit. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure it tests all those five ions. Wow. Um, yeah, Lamont also makes one. So with a titration kit, is that something you use more than once maybe? or You know, yes. the, the ones I get... Are, for uh, about $120, you get 100 tests. Oh, wow. That's and fantastic. So you pitch in the whole club or something, right? Yeah, right. And, and and maybe test once a week for a year and see what you got. I mean, that's how I learned my water. I tested every brew day, um, which is 120 days in a year, um, uh, for a year. And then I said, okay, well, I see... When it's raining, my water supply from this reservoir is this. When it's raining, my water supply from this other reservoir is this. When it's raining, my water supply from the <laughs> viaduct does this. When it's dry, these supplies do this. And I started to learn, oh, these waters taste different as well. So now I walk into the brewery, and the first thing I do is have a glass of water and say, oh, okay, this tastes like yesterday's water, or this tastes nothing like yesterday's water. Nice. And so, so for me... I've been able to correlate the test to to the organoleptic test of just tasting it. So, John, uh, let's let's jump over to you now. Let's talk about talk a little bit about residual alkalinity and what that is and how that how the water plays into that. Okay. Well, residual alkalinity is a quantification of the water chemistry, as far as the brewer is concerned. Um, it is the um, the total alkalinity is calcium carbonate, uh, which this quantity should be listed on a water report. And if it's not, then you need to have that water tested either by, you know, um, an independent lab or the city or testing it yourself uh, with a water test kit. Total alkalinity is calcium carbonate. Um, and then you subtract the calcium and magnesium concentrations divided by a uh, factor. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, typically it's, you know, the calcium plus half of the magnesium concentrated concentration as calcium carbonate divided by three and a half. Um, the basis for the equation comes from uh, Paul Kolbach in the 1940s. He, um, you know, tested and, and measured the effect of different levels of alkalinity and hardness on the distilled water pH of the malts. And so he said, okay, if I have this much alkalinity in the water versus this much hardness, um, how, how does my pH, my distilled water pH or my um, 
word pH change as a result. And so he came up with this equation. What the equation does is it allows the brewer to kind of set, um, to understand the basis of where the mash pH is going to go. Um, we, it's called residual alkalinity because you're saying, I've got this total alkalinity quantity, and now I'm subtracting the amount of hardness. How much residual alkalinity does that leave me? Mm-hmm. The more the more residual alkalinity your water has, the higher your mash pH will be. You can also manipulate your hardness by adding salts, and uh, such as calcium sulfate and calcium chloride, and re- reduce your residual alkalinity, even driving it to negative numbers, and that will actually lower your mash pH. Mm-hmm. So. Like I said, residual alkalinity is the way that you quantify the water chemistry and how it's going to affect your mash chemistry. And uh, we haven't talked about it yet, but why is all you know, why is all this important? How does this dry, you know why is mash pH so important? And you mentioned this this drives your mash pH, obviously. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I mean, briefly. Uh, your mash, your mash pH uh, is one of your factors um, for beer pH, and beer pH is one of the factors for your beer flavor, how, how the beer's flavors are expressed to the palate. Um, if the beer is high in pH, um, then the beer can taste, um, can, the taste can vary from kind of smooth to bland to you know, uh, lifeless. If the beer pH is too low, then, um, you know, the beer can be lively, or if it gets really low, it can start being kind of one-dimensional and acidic. So, um, mash pH is your best control lever for driving beer pH. There are other factors. Yeah. There are other factors that affect beer pH besides mash pH, but in terms of you, the brewer, Mash pH is your best uh, mechanism for controlling it. And what, Colin, what, why don't you which make, mash pH are you shooting for? Well, typically you're shooting for somewhere in the range of five two to five six, as measured at room temperature. Um, that range five two to five six is kind of best for conversion. You know, starch conversion to sugar. Um, it also works well for your protein degradation and. Uh, you know, haze prevention and other processes as well. Um, it's a range because there's a lot of different optimums kind of overlapping here. And depending on where what your beer recipe tastes like, you may pick the low end of that range is ideal for your recipe, or you may pick the high end of the range is ideal for your recipe. It depends. And uh, Colin can probably speak to this better because well, he's – tracks it all the time. Yeah, I was going to I was going to ask Colin next, I guess Colin, how does this uh, residual alkalinity number feed into your mash pH number? How does it interact with, you know, all the grains you're adding and everything else going into your mash? Well, you know, let me start a little bit before that. So for me, the range is 52 to 54. Um and what, why I'm choosing a specific range has to do with hop expression. I live in the hop region, one of the hop regions of the world, where we're trying to make the hoppiest beers. We're trying to get the most pleasant hop characters we can. And um, a mash pH of 5.2 compared to a mash pH of 5.4 is totally different hop expression during the boil. So I'm, I, if I'm looking for a softer hop expression, then I might be down around 5.2. If I'm looking for a little bit of a bolder hop expression, I'm up at 5.4. But up around 5.4, I start to get harsh. Now, all of this comes at a sacrifice of of efficiency. If I'm up around 5.6, I get more sugar out of my malts. Mm-hmm. Um, but I never go up there because, I, in all honesty, I, I just don't like those flavors up there. Um, now, when, when we move on from boil, boil, um, we still precipitate calcium phosphate in the boil and the pH drops during boil. So what I'm moving off into the fermenters is usually about 0.2 uh, below what my mash pH was. Okay, so if I started off at 5.4, I'm going into the fermenters at about 5.2. 
Um, then the yeast uh, uh, does some magic, which, uh, in all honesty, I don't understand the chemistry of, um, <laughs> and lowers the pH about a full point from there. Right. About 0.8 to a full point from there. Um, my yeast tends to buffer pretty well, and uh, one day I'm going to pin John down, and I'm going to talk more about the specific flavors of uh, beer pH. Um, what I find is about 4.4, 4, beer soapy. Around 4.2, beer tastes right. Around 4.0, beer tastes acidic. Um, but in between that, I don't really notice fine details. And But I'm thinking that John's actually done some more research on that since uh, we wrote the book. The finished beer yeah. pH, yeah. Um, so, Colin, though, can you can you walk us through the mash maybe? So, so we're going to start with water that is generally slightly alkaline, right? And, um, well, it could be. And it, it has. Be, uh, you, you can start with RO, too. That's true, yeah. But it, ha- and it has a uh, certain residual alkalinity, right? It has a certain residual alkalinity. And um, for pale beers, I tend to pick negative numbers. So, so let's say uh, negative 60 as CaCO3 um, would be very useful for me uh, to make a pale ale. Um, uh, I don't need a lot of body in the beer. I'm looking for it, for it to be thin. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have grains that want to do distilled mash at about 5.9, not 5.2, 5.3, which is probably where I'm looking to do a pale ale. Um, so I'm looking to add some calcium, uh, even if I'm starting with RO water, I'm at looking to add calcium. Right. And, and so then we get into the synergistic ions, which... It's a little bit outside of this part of this conversation. Yeah, we're probably but, too much detail, but I uh, basically uh, you're gonna, you know, the grains are going to lower the pH, right? Um, no, In not general. necessarily. Well, it, uh, certainly all all dark grains will. Okay, dark um, grains do. Yeah, but not necessarily uh, when when you have pure distilled water. You you could be at a, let's say you're lucky and you have pure distilled water at pH seven. You mash in with um, your favorite German Pilsner malt. Yeah, it's going to come out around 5, 9, or 6. It's going to lower it. But it's not going to lower it enough for us. Right. And so that, that leads into my next question, which I throw over to John. But how do you, John, how do you actually go about controlling the pH of the mash? You, you pretty much have to measure it, right? Yeah, you have to measure it. You have to know where you are. Um, the Kind of the holy grail when Colin and I started the book was to come up with a model or a formula for predicting mash pH. Um, so you could tell, you know, we, could, we, were, we had hoped to be able to tell our audience, um, if your residual alkalinity is this, then add this much dark malt and you will get to a particular pH or, you know, or how much, say, salt additions you needed to do to change the residual alkalinity to achieve your target mash pH with a certain grain bill. Well, we discovered during the writing of the book that it proved to be much more complicated than that. And uh, in a nutshell, all of these various malt types um, have, they do have um, some degree of acidification. Um, as Colin said, your base malts actually tend to be only weakly acidic mm-hmm. and will only bring the, the pH down from, say, 7 down, down to around 6 or maybe 5, 8, 5, 9. If you're targeting a, a mash pH of 5, 4, you've still got you know some distance to go. Yeah. Um, you can address that with, say, calcium additions. Uh, the calcium will affect the residual alkalinity of the water and help bring that down. Um, and that's what Colin was referring to with uh, adding calcium and in wanting a residual alkalinity of about, of about minus 60. Mm-hmm. Um, that works. But often it's more expedient to just uh, test your mash pH with a pH meter and then add you know, phosphoric acid or another acid uh, to the mash directly and you know, a few milliliters at a time and just monitor your pH until you, it comes down to, you know, the 5.2, 5.4 that you're trying to target. Um, a lot of brewers do it that way. So what are your what are your preferred additions for, for lowering? Generally, you got to lower the pH. What are your preferred additions for lowering the pH? Yeah. 
Well, in general, most brewing water here in the United States is um, it it often comes from a groundwater source mm-hmm. or from a surface water source. Mm-hmm. If it's from a groundwater source, um, it tends to be high in alkalinity, which means that you probably need more hardness, more calcium or magnesium to balance that alkalinity in terms of your residual alkalinity. So there's, you know, there's a case for adding calcium right. to water. If instead you have a surface water source, um, the surface water tends to be naturally low in calcium as well. Uh, so there's another reason to potentially add calcium. So in general, um, most brewers will find that they need to add or want to add calcium to their brewing water um, most of the time for most of the beer styles. And the best um, method for doing that is? Uh, is brewing salt, such yeah. as gypsum, calcium sulfate, or calcium chloride. Um, um, calcium or, hydroxide or, is another possibility. Go ahead, Colin. In a very soft water, you might even add right uh, calcium hydroxide so yeah. so that you, you're actually bringing out some alkalinity as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the alkalinity that in the water helps balance the acidity of dark malts. Um, the uh, a kilned malt such as uh, special beer or caramel one twenty actually has more acidity than some of the roast malts such as right. chocolate. And but, um, the the other thing that I've found a lot um, is leaving that that alkalinity that natural alkalinity into the water um, uh, gives you some more mouthfeel. So if you're looking for like a creamy yeah. texture or richer, fuller texture, having that alkalinity in. Um, I did a Boddington's clone uh, maybe five or six years ago because um, I thought it would be fun. I had a bunch of Maris Otter malt. Um, I had a, a bunch of East Kent Goldings laying around. I figured, hey, let's throw this together. We'll make a Boddington's clone. And it turned out that alkalinity um, turned out to be a key into making it uh, even though I was still nitrogen pushing it, without that alkalinity, um, it didn't work out right. It just didn't didn't taste right, didn't feel right. So, Colin, once you once you get into the mash, um, and you let's say you find out it's too high, too low, too high in most cases, I guess. Um, what other additions would you add besides the calcium? Um, one once because of how long it takes all these reactions to occur in my size of mash tun, all you can do at that point is add acid to lower it. Yeah. Um, I, uh, or add uh, 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 sodium bicarbonate to raise it. Um, I, I tend to not try not to make that mistake uh, so that it's not needed. Um, I, I do not try to, I, I try my best to not add anything to the mash ever. And I try to get my water right first. I try to mix it with my grains and have it turn out right. If that doesn't work, then I just brew another batch. <laughs> that must be hard on the scales you're brewing, though, right? Um, well, you know, it, it turns out if uh, your beer doesn't taste like the brand you intended, you can make up a new name. Uh-huh. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, Colin, what about the rare case where you might actually want to add uh, more alkalinity instead of more acid? Let's say you're brewing something really dark. You know, in, in the old days, uh, in the old days, and I'm talking about like a year and a half ago, I would have, I would have just firmly answered chalk, and I would have been blindly convinced that that was the right answer. Yeah. Um, in 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 doing the tech edit for the book, um, uh, AJ really uh, took us to task, and, and me especially, and taught me that you know what, Add, adding chalk to the mash doesn't really do anything. It's not very um, soluble, is it? No, it's not soluble enough, and I thought at those pHs it would be, but because it's never an issue for me, I'm always going down, not up. I just, I just assumed the textbook says it should work. I'm assuming it works. I'm just going to preach that it works. No, now, now I've been convinced that baking soda is the way to go. Baking soda is a better option, okay. Mm-hmm. E- even oh, though I don't good. like sodium, uh, yeah. that is the best way to go. Yeah, Excellent. Or calcium hydroxide is another option. So, John, uh, let's say you're an extract brewer and not an all grain brewer. Uh, what would you? you know, what, how how important it is still to control your water source and your water contents? Well, here, you know that that's 
you're you're kind of shooting in the dark um, as an extract brewer because you don't know what water chemistry the extract manufacturer was working with. Um, you know, generally the extract manufacturer they you know they're making wort, um, so they're brewing it. They're adding they're adding salts such as gypsum. They're adding acids such as phosphoric. To bring their mash pH down to five two to five four, um, and just like you know, Colin does, just like any any of us brewers do. Um, the trouble is, you don't know what their starting water was. You don't know how much of the various uh, acids or salts that they added. Um, all you know is that they produced a a beer specific wort that was then dehydrated and concentrated and delivered to you. When they do that, they just take out the water. The salts, all the minerals in that water remain. So as an extract brewer, you're best off using RO or distilled water to rehydrate that malt hmm. to you know, dilute the extract and kind of going with whatever mineral profile the original brewer was using so the the idea being that uh, that they hopefully know what they were doing when they uh, when they matched, right. mashed that's that the pr- that's the prayer yeah you, you, you can, pray that they did and and but that's not necessarily the case you know it could have been a beverage right. manufacturer that has never made beer um, uh, having worked for home brewing companies um, you, you're hoping that a brewer did it but that's not always the case right. <laughs> Interesting. So, you, so you actually say you use distilled water if you're working with uh, extracts, huh? Yeah, because then now you're just you know rehydrating the existing mineral profile. You know, it, if and when you brew that beer with RO water, and you say to yourself, you know, the hop character could be a little bit firmer, could be a little more assertive. Well, then yeah, you can add you know some calcium, gypsum. So, yeah, some gypsum to yeah. the next batch. And, you know, bump that up a little bit and see if that improves it. Um, but, you know, it's a matter of brewing, measuring, tasting, and then adjusting uh, in, to know. In, in, in an extract brew, adding uh, calcium will still lower the boil pH. The, the final boil pH will still drop if you add calcium. Right. Um, you're hoping they got it right so you don't have to do that. But if they didn't, you can actually measure... Um, your pre-boil pH, and go. Okay, well, let's add some calcium. So would that correspond? Uh, would that correspond to the mash pH? I guess. No. Well, it's a little different, right? So your boil p, your beginning boil pH is a little bit lower than your mash pH. So the the whole time this is happening, what, one of the things we learned in the book is none of these equations ever reach, reach equilibrium. Okay, so it'd be wonderful for us to just predict everything and say, yep, this is going to reach equilibrium. None of it ever does. So all you can do, you're hitting, you're shooting at a moving target. And so that target is moving lower and lower and lower the longer you have heat. And, and if you pick your points very carefully and you measure them very consistently, then you've got a shot at hitting that moving target. Um, but the target is moving. So, Let's say let's say we rehydrate our DME and we start it boiling and all of a sudden we realize we're at five six. Well, we can put in calcium sulfate if we want a more aggressive hop character, or we can put in calcium chloride if we want a rounder hop character, and and we and we can do that and we can drop that pH very quickly lower, but it's still a moving target. Okay. Um, Colin, a lot of popular beer styles are so associated with different water profiles from around the world. What do the minerals do to the taste of the beer beyond just driving the mash pH, obviously? Well, you know, that, that's a, a, a two-headed question. So yeah. the, the, the first side of that question is we're assuming that they take the water and don't adjust it. But those brewers are actually taking Dortmund water and they're ingest, adjusting it. They're taking Munich water and they're adjusting it. They're, they're, they're are, they do have strategies to make their water better. They've been using them for hundreds of years. So, so we, we can't assume that starting with their water is going to get their style of beer. But also, they can only get so far with the methods they have available to them. And we can say some things definitively about what these ions taste like. We can say that chlorides tend to round out beers. We can say 
uh, sulfates tend to sharpen hop character. We can say alkalinity tends to make beers feel fuller. Um, uh, we can say that the ratio of calcium to magnesium has an effect on the pres- the presentation of sour. And I don't know quite why or how, but calcium to magnesium um, presents itself in a way that's sour that's not pH. Um, and I'm still working on, on why that is. So these ions kind of have a synergistic effect. Um, and, and they're very important. And so if you're trying to make a, a, a something that was from Dortmund and you're using distilled water, boy, you better add a lot of ions back in. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise, you're going to make this really thin beer that has nothing to do with that style, uh, even though it might might meet the BJCP guidelines, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to taste like a beer, like a local would have tasted it if he was there. Well, a lot of these things are really important for the yeast too, aren't they? Um, it turns out that all malt warts have everything we really need for yeast, um, except for zinc. So adding a little bit of uh, zinc sulfate, and I mean a really tiny bit, um, I add about 1.2 grams to 230 gallons. Wow. Uh, and that gives me my zinc. I'm not sure I can measure enough for five gallons. Then. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm too small. Yeah. Well, John, how do you go about adjusting your local water profile if you do want to target one of these, uh, one of these popular beer styles? Well, um, you need to, you need your water report. You yeah. need to know what you're starting out with. Um, as Colin said earlier, you need to know your calcium, magnesium, total alkalinity, uh, your sulfate, and your chloride, and your sodium levels. You know, those are the keys. Sodium is just kind of long for the ride, and you want to generally keep it less than a hundred. Um, your yeah, sulfate. Don't to add chloride, salt to your beer, right? Right. Um, well, you know, you can after it's boiled, but in the mash, it tends to be an off character. Yeah. Yeah. Your then you look at your intended water profile, and software such as BeerSmith is very useful for this. <laughs> um, it what you're trying to do is, you know, look at that water profile, you know, from a from a ten thousand foot level. You know, is it is that water profile a lot of minerals or is it a little bit, you know, a low amount of minerals overall? That's kind of like the TDS, the total dissolved solids. Um, is what's the, the sulfate to chloride ratio? Is it, you know, two to one? Is it one to one? Is it four to one? Um, that kind of gives you an idea of what the character, the the character balance of that beer may be, you know, is it tend to be hop forward and dry or is it tend to be malt forward and kind of round and sweet? That's, that's one or that, that's what the chloride, the sulfate to chloride ratio helps drive. Um, then you have your calcium magnesium versus your alkalinity. In other words, your residual alkalinity and, um, that, in conjunction with the grain bill for that style, you know, is it a dark beer? Is it a pale beer? Is that residual alkalinity high as a hundred or low as in minus fifty? You know, that will help help you understand where that mash pH is going to go when you you know combine that water with the grains. So these are the kind of decisions you're you're making and you know evaluating when you look at. Um, adjusting your water to help you brew a particular style. So, Colin, um, you have several chapters tailored to commercial brewing, and obviously you're a commercial brewer, so what are some of the uh, additional concerns you run into when you're brewing big batches? Oh, well, you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, bigger than me, you you really start worrying about wastewater, um, and you start worried, uh, worrying about brewery affluence, um, all of which come from water. So if you look at a brewery my size, I'm probably using about eight gallons of water to produce a gallon of beer. So how, how, big, looking, how big is your uh, brewery? Uh, seven barrels. So Seven barrels. Uh, yeah. Uh, so small. Um, 
And and I have a lot of affluent. I, I probably uh, waste 40,000 gallons of water a year, maybe even more, maybe even 60,000 gallons of water a year. Um, and, and what's in that water is very important. I'm, I'm very concerned about the... the uh, the, the kinds of things that can be in the water that organisms can consume, uh, like nitrogens, um, uh, that make, makes it hard for my municipality to recover that water uh, and send it out. Uh, it, it, the more uh, uh, nitrogens I send down the drain, the harder it is for them. So there's things I try to separate out, like yeast, um, spent grains, um, uh, even small amounts of spent grains and, and all the yeast, uh, my trube that comes out of the bottom of the kettle, all those things I try to separate out. Now, all of those I can convert into cattle feed, um, and that's my solution. Um, but there's so much energy left in them that a bigger brewery can reutilize that energy and generate methane um, or compost uh, and actually have a saleable product. Very cool. Um, John, once we uh, once we get to the, get to actually fermenting the beer, uh, what are some of the, some of the factors that come in with water and fermentation? We talked a little bit about earlier, but well, um, yeah, I mean the as far as fermentation goes, as Colin said, that the the and all malt or the the malt supplies almost everything the yeast actually need to con- to have a good fermentation, except zinc. Um, another vital, vital yeast nutrient is magnesium, mm-hmm. but again, the malt really supplies, you know, way more than they need. Uh, the yeast will consume about five milligrams per liter of magnesium, um, during the fermentation process, but an all malt beer of say 1040 OG or, um, 10 Plato will have 70 milligrams per liter, um, so you know way more than the yeast actually need um, the say and, and as Colin was saying, the yeast are a great leveler of pH um, a good fermentation will you know will bring will consistently bring the pH of the beer down to a fairly narrow range. Um, you can adjust that by manipulating mash pH um, and to and that will you know, influence the beer pH, but um, the yeast are really, you know, a very um, a leveling factor. Um, so carry they, this carry this forward into the finished beer too. How does uh, how do some of these minerals drive flavors in the finished beer? Well, in that case, it's is as, as we said the the sulfate to chloride ratio. That kind of that's your seasoning. That's your salt and pepper in the beer. Um, you know, is that is the beer character um, dry and assertive, or is it round and sweet? That's your sulfate to chloride ratio. Um, as Colin was mentioning, you know, carbonate levels, um, the alkalinity in the water, can you know that 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 mineral character can, can have a lot to do with the beer style. If you if you think about um, Bohemian Pilsner, German Pilsner. And Dortmunder export. Here are three beer styles with almost the same grain bill, same hop bill, very similar yeast strains. Um, but the character of, the be- of, e- of these three beers is very different, and that's really due to the water. The Bohemian Pilsner, you know, very low minerals, uh, very low hardness, low alkalinity, um, almost distilled water like. German Pilsner, kind of medium levels of minerals. And you get more clean edges off your hops and off your malts um, in a German pills than you do in the Bohemian pills. Dortmund under export, high levels of minerals across the board. And now you've got a much more assertive, um, heavier bodied uh, tasting beer as a result. Well, I'd like to uh, invite Colin. If, is there anything else you'd like to add, Colin? Oh, well, that's a blank question. What are, are we... Uh 
talking about the whole realm of the internet or, or still talking about beer? <laughs> no, we're still talking about beer and water. Um, I try and stay away from politics, you know. <laughs> I do too. Um, unless you're on my Facebook page and then I, I like to antagonize people. Uh-huh. Um, so let's see, beer uh, and water. I, I would say that the most important thing is taste your water, taste your beer, start correlating how they connect to each other. Uh, the organoleptic test of tasting your water is completely underrated. There is not a brewery in, in that I have ever heard of that does not have a water tasting panel that tastes their water every batch. And it's extremely important. Your water will change flavors, and when it does, your water will change the flavors of your beer. If you're trying to make a consistent brand, taste your water. Some good, solid advice. John, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Um, no, it's just uh, the one the one question that we, you know, the over... The overall question that we really didn't address very well with the book was, you know, why are we why are we messing with all this? And it's you know it's to improve beer flavor and to improve um, our yield and our efficiency in the brewing process as well. So, um, with that in mind, you know, always you know always let the beer flavor drive your decision making. Um, don't 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 do lots of adjustment if it's not borne out in improvement in the flavor of the beer. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate it. It's really great to have you on the show again. Always my pleasure. And, Colin, this is your first appearance, but I really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you. Next time I'll bring your camera. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> we got a blank page of the book up for Colin, I guess, but... Uh, Again, the book we've been talking about is uh, uh, Colin and John wrote uh, Water, a Comprehensive Guide for Brewers from Brewers Publications. You can find it on Amazon as well. And uh, again, John is the top-selling author of How to Brew, as well as Brewing Classic Styles. And he's joined by Colin Kaminsky, who is uh, the master brewer at Downtown Joe's Brewery. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to Colin Kaminsky and John Palmer for appearing on today's show. We really appreciate them being here. I'd like to remind you, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, you can go to beersmith.com on the right sidebar there and just enter your email and your name, and we'll send you an article on home brewing every single week. And a second reminder, the Beersmith 2.2 is out for the desktop, and that includes PC, Mac, and Linux. So grab that at beersmith.com. Just go to the main download page. You can either update or if you haven't tried Beersmith before, you can download a free trial version there. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.